Chapter 13 Dragon Flight The double dune light was set high on a rickety metal frame at the end of a treacherous sands pit. From the air it looked thin and flimsy, as though the slightest gust of wind would blow it down, but Septimus knew that people said it was impressive from the ground. At the light, Septimus turned Spitfire about forty-five degrees to the left and headed out to the open sea. Septimus knew he had no need to direct the dragon, because Spitfire was, for the moment, merely retracing his earlier flight, but he enjoyed the thrill of the dragon responding to his commands. When Spitfire was earthbound, Septimus often had the uncomfortable feeling that the dragon was the one in charge, and he was merely there to do his bidding, but in the air, the positions were reversed. Spitfire became docile and calm. He obeyed, even anticipated Septimus's every wish, to the extent that sometimes Septimus felt as though the dragon could hear his very thoughts. Septimus was not completely wrong about this. He did not know that a dragon rider, particularly the dragon's imprinter, imparts his thoughts through tiny flickers of every muscle, and dragon reads the whole body of its rider, and often will know which way the rider wants to go before the rider knows him or herself. It was in this way that two days previously Spitfire had flown a very agitated Marsha Overstrand all the way to the House of Forks without a single mistake. Given the fact that Marsha had gotten the basic dragon direction instructions completely backward, this was quite an achievement. Marsha naturally believed it was her innate dragon riding skills that had gotten them safely there, but in fact it was down to Spitfire's innate extraordinary wizard ignoring skills. Septimus and Spitfire headed out across the open sea. The air grew brighter and the multitude of little white clouds disappeared, until Septimus could see nothing but blue, the azure sky around him and the sparkling sea below. He gazed down entranced, watching the shifting shadows of the currents, seeing the dark shapes of the huge whales that inhabited the deep trough over which they were flying. The late spring air was cold at five hundred feet, but the warmth generated by Spitfire's muscles provided Septimus with a not unpleasant microclimate of his own. As long as he ignored the occasional waft of hot, smelly dragon breath, soon the rhythmic up-down, up-down flight of the dragon lulled Septimus into a half-dreamlike state, where magical rhymes swirled around his head, and dragony songs played in his ears. Some hours passed in this way until suddenly he was jolted awake. Septimus! Septimus! Someone was calling his name. Septimus sat up, at once alert and confused. How could anyone possibly be calling him? He shook himself and muttered, It was a dream, you dillop. To chase away the fuzziness in his head, he looked down at the ocean once more and gasped with wonder. Far below was a jewel-like group of islands. A large central island lay surrounded by six smaller satellite islands. All were a deep lush green bordered with little coves and white sandy beaches, while between the islands the delicate blue-green of clear shallow sea sparkled in the sunlight. Septimus was entranced. Suddenly he longed to be sitting on a warm hillside and drink from cool springs bubbling up through mossy rocks. For a second, no longer, he thought about taking Spitfire down to one of the little coves and landing on the sand. In response, the dragon began dropping in height. Immediately, Septimus came to his senses. No, Spitfire, no, we have to go on, he said regretfully. Spitfire resumed his flight and Septimus turned around to watch the exquisite circle of islands recede. Eventually the islands disappeared from view, and a strange feeling of loss came over him. He and Spitfire were alone once more. Dragon and Imprinter flew on into the late afternoon. Above them white clouds came and went, and below, the occasional ship trailed its white path through the endless pattern of waves, but there were no more islands. As early evening approached, the clouds began to thicken until they formed a thick, gray ceiling. The air temperature plummeted, and Septimus felt chilled to the bone. He drew his wolverine fur around him more tightly, but he still felt cold. Septimus did not realize how cold he had become. It took him a good ten minutes to remember that Marcia had insisted on packing what she had called her emergency kit, which she had personally loaded onto Spitfire in heavy carpet saddlebags. Marcia had told Septimus that she had packed six bright red heat cloaks, which she had been very excited to find in Bot's Wizard's second-hand cloak shop. After another ten minutes spent trying to open the saddlebags, which Marcia had very effectively laced closed, Septimus managed to get his ice-cold hand to pull out a heat cloak. He wrapped the oddly crinkly cloak around him. 
Immediately, the warmth spread through him like a hot bath, and his thoughts began to work once more. By now, the light was dimming fast. Ahead on the horizon, Septimus could see the dark rim of the coming night. A spattering of rain began, but it seemed that the heat cloak repelled water, too. Septimus pulled on his old red beanie hat, which he had slipped into his pocket before he left. It was a tight fit now, but he didn't care. No other hat felt quite the same. Now he was totally rain and windproof. Septimus turned his attention to the horizon once more. The dark line of night was wider, and within it he thought he could see a faint ribbon of lights. Septimus kept his eyes fixed on the horizon, and as the twilight deepened and Spitfire drew ever nearer, the ribbon of lights shone brighter by the second. A thrill of excitement ran through Septimus. He had done it. He had found his way back to the trading post, and one of those lights belonged to Jenna, Nico, Snorri, and Beetle, sitting in their damp little net loft, waiting for him to rescue them. Septimus leaned back against the pilot's spine and grinned. The dragon rescue team had done it again. Half an hour later, night had fallen and they had reached land. Spitfire was flying low and fast along a sandy coast. The sky had cleared, and the waning gibbous moon was rising, casting a silver light and long shadows on the land below. Septimus leaned out and saw, scattered among the sand dunes, the dark shapes of fishermen's cottages, faint candles burning in the windows, and little boats pulled up onto the beach for the night. Beyond, he could see the ribbon of lights of the trading post shining brighter than ever, illuminating the long string of harbors. Now Septimus slowed Spitfire down and swooped in even lower. Below, he saw the first of the long line of harbors, Harbor Number 49, if he remembered rightly. But since Harbor Number 3 was the one they were heading for, there was still some way to go. Spitfire's wings beat steadily as he flew over each harbor in succession. Excited, Septimus peered down and saw the dark shapes of ships, tied up along harbor walls, standing out against the light from lines of lanterns and torches along the quaysides. He could see throngs of people bustling about, busy loading and unloading, bargaining and trading. A sound of voices drifted up, a cacophony of unfamiliar languages, of arguments and laughter, punctuated by the odd shout. No one noticed the dark shape of the dragon above, or its faint moon shadow moving silently over the quays. Septimus patted Spitfire's neck and whispered, Well done, Spitfire, well done. We're nearly there. The trading post had grown along a sheltered shoreline on the edge of the vast open land that contained, among many other wonders, the House of Forex. It had become a center for traders, not only the northern traders, but those from even further away. Before the winter's ice had even melted, fur-clad traders marooned deep in the ice countries would push their long, narrow boats along the frozen ditches that snaked through the forests until they came to the wide, free-flowing canals that eventually gave out into the trading post. Tall, bright-robed traders from the hills of the dry deserts brought their brilliantly painted ships across the sea, and occasionally even traders from countries beyond the eastern snow plains could be seen, with their distinctive tall, pointy hats, and their staccato voices could be heard cutting through the hubbub. As Spitfire flew on, Septimus kept a lookout for harbor number three. It was one of the smaller harbors at the very end of the trading post, just beyond the widest canal, the one that led all the way to the other side of the world, so they said. Harbor number three was, he knew, easy to recognize by its unusual horseshoe shape. It was not a deep-water harbor, but was used by fishermen with small boats, which they left tied onto outhauls stretched out over the sand that was uncovered at low tide. It was not long before Spitfire had crossed the wide, wind-swept canal, and Septimus saw the welcome horseshoe shape below. Spitfire began circling, looking for somewhere to land, but the quay was cluttered with fish boxes and piles of nets. There was no open patch of ground large enough for a dragon to land, and no dragon will ever land near nets due to a deep-seated dread of getting their talons trapped in the mesh, a fear left over from the great dragon-hunting days of the past. The tide was going out, and in the shadows along the edge of the harbor wall, Septimus spotted an empty strip of sand with no ropes across it. He steered the dragon a few hundred yards out to sea, and then brought him in low across the water, allowing him to glide gracefully down, until with a soft thud and in a spray of wet sand, Spitfire landed. The dragon sniffed the air, and then wearily laid his head on the damp sand, allowing Septimus to clamber down and set foot on land once more. Septimus wiggled his feet to try to get some feeling back into his toes. Then, 
A little unsteadily, he went and rubbed the dragon's velvety, ice-cold nose. "'Thank you, Spitfire,' he whispered. "'You're the best.' The dragon snorted, and from the shadows of the quayside above came a woman's voice. "'Don't do that! It's so rude!' A man's voice protested. "'Don't do what? I didn't do anything!' "'Huh. You always say that. You can't blame it on the dog out here!' The arguing couple wandered off, and before they were out of earshot, Spitfire had fallen asleep. Septimus checked the tide, it was on its way out, and from the look of the high tide mark on the harbor wall, he figured Spitfire had at least six hours to safely sleep where he was. Septimus heaved off Marsh's saddlebags, extracted four roast chickens and a bag of apples, and placed them beside the dragon's nose, in case he woke for a midnight snack. "'Wait here, Spitfire. I'll be back,' Septimus whispered. Spitfire opened a bleary eye, blinked, and went back to sleep. Septimus shouldered the heavy saddlebags and wearily headed up the harbor steps. Now all he had to do was remember which net loft it was that Nico had chosen. 